What will Starship test on its next flight? A six planet system in perfect resonance, and Betelgeuse might not be rotating at all. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. In a recent question show, someone asked me what's probably going to be next for SpaceX Starship. And although you know we haven't got any kind of official announcement yet from SpaceX on exactly what their goals are going to be, I predicted that they're going to just skip a bunch of steps. They're not going to try to repeat the previous mission. They're going to try to add some additional new milestones. You know, they even though the spacecraft exploded, they learned enough lessons from the exploding spacecraft to feel like they can move forward. And one really interesting proposal that's been pitched is to do space-based cryogenic transfer. Back in 2020, NASA put out a request for companies to demonstrate that they could do space-based cryogenic fuel transfer. And this is going to be huge because right now when you think about every space mission, like they launch from the ground with all of the fuel that they're going to have for their entire mission. And imagine if a spacecraft could say fly to the moon and then dock with a fuel depot, fill its propellant tanks again, and then carry on more missions. Like a lot of missions that wrapped up because the spacecraft ran out of fuel could go away. And so NASA is really eager to do this. But also, the HLS, the human landing system, which is going to be a modified SpaceX Starship, has to demonstrate this space-based propellant transfer quite a bit so they can get to the point that they're able to demonstrate that they're able to launch Starship, transfer a bunch of fuel, fly to the moon, and then be able to land humans on the surface of the moon. And so one idea that's being floated around is that the next version of Starship is going to carry giant oxygen propellant tanks inside Starship. And then it's going to demonstrate that it can transfer the propellant from one tank to the other, all within Starship. NASA's award, it's called the Tipping Point Award. This is going to give whoever can demonstrate this in space, $53 million. They have to be able to transfer 10 metric tons of cryogenic propellant from one tank to another in space. And it could be that SpaceX is going to take a crack at this with the next SpaceX Starship launch. A planetary system in perfect resonance. We've been talking about a lot of really cool exoplanetary systems with lots and lots of planets. Think about the TRAPPIST-1 system. There was this other system that was found with six planets. Well, now astronomers have found an exoplanetary system with six sub-Neptune planets. But what makes this system interesting is that all of the planets are in perfect resonance. And so to think of an example of orbital resonance, think about Jupiter and think about the moons of Jupiter. Jupiter's moons are in a one, two, four orbital resonance. So every time that Io completes four orbits around the planet, Europa completes two orbits and Ganymede completes one. So in this new planetary system designated HD 110067, you have these various planets that are in orbital resonance. And this is considered to be fairly rare that probably only 1% of planetary systems out there have this kind of an orbital resonance. And it sort of depends on the stability of the system, how circular their orbits are, what kinds of perturbations happen early on. A lot of this would lead to them not being able to have resonance. The planets were first found by NASA's test satellite. It was able to find two of the planets orbiting around the star. And then following observations were made with KEOPS, which is a European Space Agency mission that's only job is to characterize, to follow on observations of exoplanetary system discoveries. And so it was able to find all of the rest of the planets. The second fast radio burst coming from a hypernebula. Man, I can't believe I'm even just like saying these words a hypernebula, like this is a thing. So now we've been talking about fast radio bursts for quite a while. These are these weird, random, extragalactic blasts of radio emissions that are coming from seemingly everywhere across the sky. And astronomers aren't entirely sure what they are, but they appear to have some connection with magnetars. Like a magnetar is a type of neutron star with incredibly intense magnetic fields. And as the star is turning, as these magnetic fields are interacting with their local environment, it's believed that maybe they can release blasts of radio emissions. Now, most of the fast radio bursts that have ever been found are completely random. They don't repeat, but a few have been found that do repeat. And so astronomers have found the second example of a repeating 
fast radio burst that is located inside a hypernebula. Now, the discovery was made using China's fast radio telescope. This is the largest radio telescope on Earth. And they were able to measure the size of the nebula to about 30 light years across. And that's big, like that's about three times the size of the Crab Nebula. And they were able to pinpoint the location of this magnetar that is inside the nebula that is rotating very quickly and it is blasting out these radio emissions. It's about 30 times the brightness of the sun. And it's believed that the magnetar is brand new, like between nine and 1900 years old. And the nebula that's surrounding it is about 900 years old. And so whatever this thing is, it's very recent. And the interaction between the magnetar and the nebula is creating this sort of extremely energetic version of a nebula, which they're calling a hypernebula. I just love that term. Chandrayaan 3's final trick. So back in August, we saw the successful landing of the Vikram lander and the rover. And this was great because with Chandrayaan 2 mission, it crashed onto the surface. But now with Chandrayaan 3, they were successful, deployed the lander, deployed the rover, everything was great. But in fact, the fuel tanks on board the propulsion module of the Chandrayaan 3 still had about 100 kilograms of fuel on board. And so mission planners at India's space research organization decided they were going to give the spacecraft another job. The Chandrayaan-3 propulsion module was orbiting very close to the moon. And so it fired its thrusters and shifted out of a lunar orbit and then back into an Earth orbit at an altitude of over 100,000 kilometers. That's about three times the height of the geostationary satellite orbit. And this is important because the propulsion module had a science instrument on board that was designed to study the Earth, but they were doing this from lunar orbit. And so with this extra fuel, they were able to get much closer to the Earth and gather data with more clarity. And so one of the other advantages to this new orbit is that this allowed ISRO to practice a type of orbital maneuver that they're going to use for a future sample return mission. And so they got like a lot of extra science out of the Chandrayaan-3 mission, in addition to landing on the moon. Does Betelgeuse even rotate? Now Betelgeuse, of course, is one of the closest red supergiant stars that we know of. And it's like one of the only stars that we can resolve features on its surface. All the other stars are just single pixels, but Betelgeuse, we get a couple of pixels. And that's because the star is monstrous. But one of the weird puzzles about Betelgeuse is that it's turning way too quickly than the simulations would expect. When you look at the surface of red giant stars, they should be turning at about one kilometer per second. And when you look at the surfaces of red supergiant stars, they should be turning at about 0.1 kilometers per second. And that makes sense that the star is turning at one speed and then as it grows, it's turning much more slowly. But Betelgeuse, turns at over five kilometers per second. Now, one of the theories proposed to explain that was that Betelgeuse consumed a partner. And so by gobbling up another star inside, that spun it back up again. But a new study proposes that in fact, there's too much uncertainty in the measurement data for Betelgeuse's rotation, and that it might not rotate at all. And of course, that would be much more similar to the simulations for what these red supergiants should do. It should be more possible to get a more accurate measurement of Betelgeuse's rotation speed, just it's going to require more detailed observations with some of the largest telescopes on Earth. But we could get an answer to this question. And if it does turn really quickly, I do like that idea that Betelgeuse consumed a partner star. Every week, we give you a chance to vote on what you thought was the best story of the week. And last week, the winning story was Hubble went offline. Ugh. <laughs> I mean, it's scary, but also I can see why it's a pretty big piece of news. So thank you everybody who voted. We post the new poll onto our community tab within a couple of days of when we post the news. And so when you see it in the community tab or when you're scrolling on YouTube, go ahead, give us a vote. Tell us what you thought was the best story of the week. And if you want the best chance to get it, make sure you subscribe, click the notification bell, and then you'll for sure get a notification when a new poll goes up. An intergalactic star at the heart of the Milky Way. So I want to show you this really cool picture. This is an image of the region right around the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way also known as Sag A star. And this region of space only measures 
0.4 light years across. And so one star has been highlighted in this image. It's called S0-6. And this star is only 0.04 light years away from the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way. And so when astronomers studied this star, they found that it had a chemical composition similar to the kinds of stars that came from the dwarf galaxies that were merged into the Milky Way. And so this star didn't come from the Milky Way, it was one of the stars that was part of a past merger. And so it probably traveled tens of thousands of light years to get all the way down to the heart of the Milky Way into this final configuration. And like there are a lot of stars that are close to Sag A star, and yet the region around the supermassive black hole is so intense. You can't get stars forming in this location. All of them had to migrate, and it turns out that one of them had a very long migration. A possible explanation for the Hubble tension. All right, it's time to talk about the Hubble tension again, or the crisis in cosmology. And this is this concept that when you measure the expansion rate of the universe relatively close to us, you get one measurement, and that's very different when you measure the expansion rate at the farthest distances. And the two measurements don't have error bars that overlap. What's going on? And so one new paper came out that is proposing that in fact, where the Milky Way is located is actually in a bubble of space that is less dense than the rest of the universe. And that in fact, there's more galaxies around the edge of this bubble. It's about 3 billion light years across. And so they are accelerating galaxies away from us that accounts for this measurement mismatch. The problem is that having that level of an under density in a part of the universe violates the standard model of cosmology. And so people are going to say, well, you can't just violate the standard model of cosmology to get this answer. But one of the other things that it has in its favor is that if MOND is the explanation for dark matter, then it would also help to explain these cavities of lower density in the universe. So the mystery deepens. Everyone is thinking of every possible idea and they're trying to test them all out against the observations that we have in the universe to try to get to the bottom of this. Every week, I write an email newsletter that I send out to almost 70,000 people. And this is a really detailed list of every single space and astronomy news story that we're covering on Universe Today. When we do Space Bites, we're having to choose maybe 10 stories out of almost 50 stories that we're publishing on Universe Today. So there's a lot of really cool ideas that are still going there. So if you want to get all of the space news, go and sign up to my weekly email newsletter. Go to universetoday.com slash newsletter. I write the whole thing. There's no ads in it at all. It's completely free. Red sprites seen from space. This is a really cool scientific mystery that took a while for scientists to get to the bottom of this. For the longest time, there was this rumor of weird red glows that would appear above thunderclouds. And scientists would call these red sprites or transient luminous events. And there was like serious argument on whether or not this was really a thing or not. And over time, scientists were able to gather enough data to say, yes, indeed, these are a real thing. And now they're able to study them with incredible precision. So these are large scale electrical discharges that appear above thunderclouds at about 50 to 90 kilometers altitude. And the best place to study them is from space. And so ESA astronaut Dr. Andreas Mogensen is on board the International Space Station and he has a specially equipped camera that can take pictures 100,000 times a second. And it's able to build up images of these red sprites forming above these thunderclouds. And so there's just a beautiful kind of eerie image that he took of one of these red sprites. And this has been one of his primary scientific focus while he's on board the station. And in fact, last time he was on the station back in 2015, he was looking at a different kind of atmospheric phenomena called blue jets. These are a type of lightning that emanate upward from lightning storms. And there's an amazing like 160 second long video that shows 245 of these blue jets that Dr. Morganson took last time he was on the ISS. The largest iceberg is on the move. Back in 1988, an enormous iceberg broke away from the Fischner Rhone ice shelf. It didn't get far. It grounded on the bottom of the ocean, very close by, and it sat there for more than 40 years. 
And finally, after all of the waves pounding it back and forth, after it melted a little bit off of the bottom, it's now free and clear of the seafloor. It's now just drifting in the Antarctic Ocean at about 4.8 kilometers per day. This is a monster iceberg. It's about 4,000 square kilometers across. It's about 400 meters thick, but it's not the biggest iceberg that we've ever seen. In fact, an even bigger one called B-15 broke away from the Ross ice shelf back in 2000. And that one measured almost 11,000 square kilometers across. Who knows, maybe you'll get a visit from this gigantic iceberg in the future. I'm gonna talk more about refueling spacecraft in orbit, but first I'd like to thank Hey Twyla, Dougie Stewart, Stephen Krasaki, David Richards, Mark Ansis, Joel Yancey, Antonio Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Vlad Shiblin, Modso, George, David Gilson, Andrew Gross, Jeremy Maddard, Josh Schultz, and Jordan Young, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. I've been really fascinated by space-based refueling for quite a while. In fact, I did a video on that topic many, many years ago. And what I found when I was starting to research into this story was that a lot of people have done a lot of work into the challenges of being able to refuel spacecraft from space. United Launch Alliance had originally developed a very comprehensive plan to launch a orbital fuel depot that could serve as a place to refuel various spacecraft and support various missions going off into space. And NASA has been doing a lot of development in orbital refueling. They actually have a, an experiment on board the International Space Station where they've been testing space-based maintenance and refueling of satellites. And so a lot of thought has gone into this. And like the big challenges of this are that when you take fuels into space in a very low pressure environment, it's really hard to get your fuel to stay where you need it inside your fuel depot, that it has a tendency to want to boil off into space. And these problems have not been completely solved. We don't know how to keep propellants in space where we want them and not have them just boil away into vapor. And yet, when you think about the future kinds of missions, a lot of problems would be solved by having additional fuel available. Keeping the fueling part of your mission very simple and have a giant fuel tanker that goes and delivers fuel to the spacecraft and then have more specialized spacecraft which have less fuel on board that are able to complete more complex missions. And one of the big requirements for the upcoming Artemis 3 launch, for them to be able to land humans on the surface of the moon, it's been estimated that it's gonna need more than 15 launches from Starship to refuel the propellant depot so that the human landing system can connect up to it, transfer all the propellant and make its journey up to the moon. But a fully refueled spacecraft in orbit gives you access to huge chunks of the solar system. It gives you just a lot more leeway to be able to go to the moon, return, go to Mars, land safely, visit the outer solar system, and a lot of really interesting missions that we've planned. So space-based refueling is one of the great challenges of space exploration. If we can solve it, then it will make a lot of problems go away. It'll introduce new ones, but I think it's definitely one of the big outstanding issues that need to be solved right now. I'll put a link to that video just to warn you, it's several years old. All right, we'll see you next week.